Welcome back to Ready Player None, the only podcast that says, Anti Gherkin, what are you doing here? Is it too late in the game to try and introduce an internet review of Illin Persona into the show? Wade is at the mercy of IOI, working from their tech support centre to try and take it down from within. But he's just uncovered some private information that threatens to put his friends in danger. And not just because he's basically doxed them. Let's see if his hoarding of private information saves the day in chapter 31. So, Wade spends four hours hacking into the Oology Division's database. Most of that consists of copying the data to his flash drive. He also submits an Executive Oologist Supply Requisition Order. A very specific item, we're not told what it is, but it's either a weapon or a piece of equipment, will be delivered to him in the Oasis two days from now. He finishes hacking at 6.30 in the morning, and work begins at 8. He's got a last couple of things to do before he logs out of the system. For starters, he zeroes his outstanding balance that he owes IOI. Then, by accessing the Indentured Servant Observation Communications Tag Control Settings submenu, he disables the locking mechanisms on his ear gear and security anklet. The ear gear retracts from the cartilage of his ear and drops to the floor, and the shackle on his ankle clicks open as well. I'd now passed the point of no return. So this is a weird part here. IOI security techs weren't the only ones who had access to my ear gear's vid feed. The Indentured Servant Protection Agency also used it to monitor and record my daily activities, to ensure that my human rights were being observed. That's a weird dropping in of an organisation in this throwaway line. They're not doing a very good job of it, are they? But now that he has no personal vid feed, if IOI security caught me before I made it out of the building, carrying a stolen flash drive filled with highly incriminating company data, I was dead. The Sixers could torture and kill me and no one would ever know. Rip. Lol. He also says he performs a few final tasks related to my escape plan. So that's the get out clause if Ernest Klein wants to introduce anything else he forgot to pre-establish. There's a maintenance panel next to his entertainment console in which he's hidden a perfectly pressed and vacuum sealed IOI maintenance tech uniform complete with a cap and an ID badge. Now this has the sheer gall to be presented in brackets. Like the flash drive, I'd obtained these items by submitting an intranet requisition form, then had them delivered to an empty cubicle on my floor. What was I literally just saying about not pre-establishing things? Did Ernest not have a backspace key? Wade changes into the maintenance uniform, using his old indent jumpsuit to wipe the blood off his ear, and using two stashed band-aids to hide the hole that the ear gear left in his earlobe. I'll be generous today because the word band-aid has entered American parlance as a genericized trademark, but I'd still like to make a note that he's unable to do something like simple first aid without mentioning a popular brand name. Then I picked up my ear gear and spoke into it. I need to use the bathroom, I said. The hab unit door irised open at my feet. I don't know why, my first instinct was that there was an iris toilet in the floor. But no, the hab unit has automatically opened the door so that he can go to a communal bathroom. But that's not where he's going. He heads to the lifts, passing a few other indents who don't make eye contact. The perfect disguise. His maintenance ID and hacked security bracelet allow him to access any floor. The ID's under the name of Harry Tuttle, which is also the name of someone from Brazil. These don't sound like very Brazilian names. He heads for the lobby. I rode the elevator down in silence, trying not to stare at the camera mounted above the doors. But I'm realising that all the security camera footage would be scrutinised when this is all over, and that Sorrento and his superiors would all see it. I looked directly into the lens of the camera, smiled, and scratched the bridge of my nose with my middle finger. Very mature. The lift reaches the lobby, and Wade steps out into a crowd of IOI middle management workers. It was like crossing the border into another country. These were all regular employees scurrying about, and Wade wonders if it bothers them, knowing that thousands of indentured slaves lived and toiled here in the same building, just a few floors away from them. Wade spots two security guards at the reception desk and gives them a wide berth, self-consciously making for the exit. You know those parts in movies where someone is in disguise, and for a minute there's a tense moment as if it seems like everything's going to fall apart, but then it turns out to be innocuous and harmless? We get two of those in a row, and one works a lot better than the other. The first is that Wade realises he's still wearing his plastic slippers they gave to him. Every footstep he takes seems to squeak off the marble floor, and nothing comes of it. Completely worth mentioning. The next one is when a woman stops him as he's nearly out of the door, but all she's doing is stopping him to tell him that his ear is bleeding. The plasters he'd put on have fallen off at some point. Frozen with indecision, all he can manage is muttering thanks, before making a beeline for the door. The frozen morning wind was so fierce that it nearly knocked me over. Yeah, and just like that, he's out. 
no hitches, no problems, everything pre-planned, completely off screen. No one can stop Wade Watts. Though someone should. He drops the anklet in a bin, oh sorry, trash receptacle, and then heads down the street as fast as he can walk. His destination is the mailbox. What, in Birmingham? A post office rental outlet located four blocks from the IOI Plaza. Get a load of this as well. The week before my arrest, I'd rented a post office box here online and had a top of the line portable Oasis rig shipped to it. Thanks for letting us know. The mailbox is like an automated post office, so there's no employees there to eye him suspiciously for wearing a maintenance tech outfit and plastic slippers in freezing cold weather. He rips open his portable Oasis rig right there on the floor, then he logs into the Oasis. Gregarious Simulation Systems was located less than a mile away, so I was able to use one of their complimentary wireless access points instead of one of the city nodes owned by IOI. That's convenient. My heart was pounding as I logged in. I'd been offline for eight whole days, a personal record. No, I can't make fun of him for that, I'd be the same. He materialises back on Falco! I looked down at my virtual body, admiring it like a favourite suit I hadn't worn in a while. He's inundated with message windows, from H, Shoto, and to my surprise there was even a message from Artemis. They're all panicked by his radio silence. I replied to Artemis first. Gross. He tells her about all the information the Sixers have on her, as well as their plans to abduct her. He also sends her a copy of the dossier as proof. His email tells her to run away from home immediately. She's got to find somewhere safe off the grid, log into the Oasis through a non-IOI ISP, and meet him in H's basement. Oh, gross! Then it gets worse. At the bottom of the message, I added a short postscript. P.S. I think you look even more beautiful in real life. Shut up! You absolute creep! God, I hate you. I sent similar emails to Shoto and H, minus the postscript. Yeah, very witty sidebar there. You didn't dox and sexually harass your two other friends. Do you want a round of applause? He also logs back into the United States Citizen Registry database. He sees that his Bryce Lynch identity is now a wanted fugitive. But using his Leet Hacksaw's powers, he deletes Lynch, transferring his fingerprints and retinal patterns back over to his original profile. When I logged out of the database a few minutes later, Bryce Lynch no longer existed. I was Wade Watts once again. Page break. I'm really enjoying saying page break. Time for a shopping montage. Wade hails an auto cab, one of those automatic taxis. Specifically, not one from Supra Cab, which is an IOI subsidiary. This scene's partly here to establish that the system recognises his thumbprint as belonging to Wade Watts rather than Bryce Lynch. He has the cab take him to High Street. This is the weird thing to me as a British person, because by instinct I would say the High Street, but no, it's just a street named High. High Street. Strange. His destination this time is Threads, with a 3 instead of an E. A shop that specialises in high-tech urban streetwear. You know, like hackers. His first purchases are jeans and a sweater, classified as dichotomy wear. This means they're wired up for use in the Oasis, a bit like the haptic suits, but without the tactile feedback, making it easier to control my avatar than with a gloves-only interface. He also buys socks, underwear, a simulated leather jacket, boots, a woolly hat. So he's just Neo from the Matrix, but in a woolly hat now, isn't he? At least he's not going to freeze to death. He bins the jumpsuit and the plastic shoes and heads down High Street to Vendall. This is a franchise chain of vending machines that sold everything under the sun. Because again, an automated shop means that no one's there to ask him awkward questions. From here, Wade buys a gun, as well as some ammo, a flak vest, and a small canister of mace. The vending machine scans his palm to verify his identity and check his criminal record. And then, thunk, the vending machine dispenses a gun. <laughs> we truly live in a society. He's never held a real gun, though he's familiar with Oasis weapons. This one scans his handprint so that only he can use it? Isn't this a direct rip-off of that Bond film? Which one was it? Oh, Skyfall. Oh, that came out three years after this, then. The cyberpunk in this chapter goes up to 11, as Wade's next destination is The Plug, an oasis parlour. Read Internet Cafe. Their shop marquee has a smiling anthropomorphic fibre optic cable. What would that even look like? I'm having difficulty imagining an anthropomorphic cable. They had a reputation for high prices and outdated software, but their connections were supposed to be fast, reliable and lag free. And not only that, but they're also not owned by IOI. This is going to be the safest place Wade can find to connect to the Oasis. 
The place is unoccupied and a little bit worn, but it's the employee behind the counter that just seems like a collection of post-punk cyber cliches. He was in his early 20s with a mohawk and dozens of facial piercings. When he spoke, I saw that his teeth had all been sharpened to points. Dial it back a bit, yeah? A lot of information here about how the rental system works. I don't care. Wade does have to sign the T's and C's saying that if he does anything illegal while renting their property, the plug holds no responsibility. That's a sentence I never thought I'd say. The clerk is very skeptical of Wade. He says that Wade has to pay in advance to use a deluxe rig for 12 hours while uploading 10 zettabytes of data and having the Mondo upgrade package. The total price is 11,000 big ones. I can't remember if this is supposed to be credits or dollars, but it still sounds like a lot. He looked more than a little surprised when the transaction cleared. Then he gives Wade a keycard advisor and some gloves and points him towards a free bay. If you leave any kind of mess in the bay, we'll have to keep your deposit. Vomit, urine, semen, that kind of thing. Thanks for that mental image, Ernie. Bay 14 was a soundproofed 10x10 room with a late model haptic rig in the centre. Presumably he's using their equipment as like the equivalent to a burner phone. He slides a data drive into the Oasis console. Is that the same thing as a flash drive? The only reason I'm asking, because with a voice command of Max, he resurrects late character Ma Ma Max Headroom. I thought we'd seen the last of him. He gets to work uploading the data from the flash drive to his Oasis account. I paid GSS a monthly fee for unlimited data storage in my account, and I was about to test its limits. It's an estimated three hours before the data is finished transferring. I reordered the upload sequence so the files I needed access to right away would get transferred first. His first course of action is send an email to every news feed, telling them how Daito really died. By way of evidence, he attaches that video clip he'd got of the IOI employees throwing him over the edge of his balcony. The perfect smoking gun. Is that what a smoking gun is? Note to self, look up what a smoking gun is. He also attaches Sorrento's memo to kidnap Artemis and Shoto, as well as the recorded footage of the chatling session he had with him in the only good chapter of this book. Of course, he bleeps the part where Sorrento says his real name and shows off his school photo. I wasn't yet ready to reveal my true identity to the world. I plan to release the unedited video later, once the rest of my plan had played out. Then it wouldn't matter. He also writes up an open letter to every single Oasis user. We don't yet learn the contents, but he saves it to his drafts folder, so that's coming back. Then I logged into H's basement. When my avatar appeared inside the chat room, I saw that H, Artemis and Shoto were already there waiting for me. End chapter 31. No one can stop Wade Watts. That's what we know. Whether it's in the Oasis or in the real life, if he puts his mind to it, he'll solve the problem immediately. Usually with some hitherto unmentioned secret power or ability or knowledge or something he prepared off screen. We start to see the cyberpunk roots of the story come to the fore in this chapter, as opposed to them just being a perfect recreation of one of Ernest Klein's favourite cyberpunk films. But as with the desert full of road warriors, I can't help but think more interesting things are happening outside of this story. Not a bad chapter by any means, apart from that gross note to Artemis but certainly a more pedestrian chapter. This late in the game, we're still trying to set up the final climax. We've still got 70 pages to go. You should be somewhere in your final climax by now. This is just another wander through your world's culture with nothing really challenging your main character. Oh well. If you want more from someone who's wandering through life, you can follow me on Twitter at The Last Gherkin or follow the show on Twitter at RPN underscore pod. Watch with subtitles on YouTube, The Last Gherkin, or download MP3s of the first 20 episodes or so at thelastgherkin.podbean.com. Join us next time as Wade reunites with his horrible friends in another episode prepared entirely off screen without me telling you I did it. Welcome back! <laughs> Ooh, did you hear the crack in my voice then? But he's just uncovered some pri- Cupboard. <laughs> this is a franchise change. Change. Who's hammering something right outside my window?